Great, thank you, Chris. It's good to see everybody. Actually, for the first Zoom, I can't see myself on here, which is actually a godsend, but it, it, there's Katie. I can see Katie, actually. Good to see you. And I did see you, Frank. Uh, can you, Katie, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, because I'm not getting any feedback, Great. So we're sharing a screen with you, and we're going to walk you through uh, the response that Light has to this uh, global pandemic for COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Thanks for joining us. I hope you're all doing okay in all your various states of lockdown and, and stay in place. Uh, we might go on to the first page. So um, there are some folks that are joining us that have been involved with the light for many years and others that are new. So we're gonna give you a quick summary again of who we are. We're a humanitarian organization focused on displaced people. Um, our mission is to create meaningful lives with and for the displaced, and we see our purpose as unleashing the abundance we find in every person, no matter where we find them, whether they're refugees in a settlement, whether there are people living in, in conflict, like a place like Somalia, um, seeking health care in a place like Congo, or uh, living in neighborhoods in El Salvador, actually. And Alight's also a family of organizations. We have... Um, a couple of other organizations that are part or that, that you know, we've, we've joined together as a family. So we have Quesco, uh, an amazing organization working on education and with young people in the Middle East. We have ORAM working with LGBTQ refugees. And we have the Eastern Congo Initiative that is focused in Congo. And we have our own uh, spin-off, which is Kuja Kuja, which is our accountability tool for refugees. And I'll mention that briefly a little bit later. We have around two and a half thousand team members all over the world in the countries that you see here on the slide. Mexico, Salvador, all the way across through Sudan, South Sudan, Myanmar, Thailand, Somalia, all of these locations. And so when the COVID outbreak happened, for us it was a matter of how do we gear up actually and, how, and put ourselves in a situation where we can respond proactively and effectively for the many millions of people that we serve, we actually, in any particular year, serve around 3 million people that are affected by displacement or conflict in the countries that you see. And our team members, those 2,500 team members that you see there, are all spread out and living in all of those countries. And so, uh, you know, when this broke out, we convened our global teams together via Zoom, just like we are with you, and we began our response. So I might click through. We're also joined, by the way, just so you know, on this call, we're being joined by our country director, Molly Henry, actually, has just joined us. You see her there. I'm just calling her out because a little bit late, so I just want to make a point. But um, secondly, we're joined by our country director from uh, Rwanda, Bernard. If you're there, uh, Bernard, you can put in the text, I'm here and I'm ready to answer people's questions. We also have Annie who's working on, our, on the color movement and our global sister response. And what I'll be doing is handing over to them at various points to make some comments. That's one of the beauties of Zoom. So we all get to see each other no matter where we are and see inside each other's home, which is really fun. So we're, we are responding as an organization to coronavirus. Initially, we started in those uh, 16 countries that you saw, but actually over the last month, it's really expanded now to where we're reaching around 44 million people now in 44 countries. And so the rest of this presentation is going to be breaking down what that looks like. Um, starting with the work we're doing in the alike countries where we're actually working actively on the ground, but then moving and looking at some of the other work we're doing, for example, the work with the sisters and through a social media and health education and awareness raising campaign called In Our Hands, and I'll be talking about all of those. Um, so we might click uh, to the next slide. So um, this is like a truly dreadful photograph, but really nothing dreadful is happening here. I just want you to imagine everybody's smiling, but you know, during a pandemic, there's not a lot of smiles to be had, particularly when a scary person is standing next to you in all of this um, attire. Um, what, what we're doing, the light response to the COVID um, outbreak is we're focused on three things, and so we have three major objectives. Objective number one is to stop where we can the spread of the virus. Number two, to maintain the critical services we provide and gear ourselves up 
to provide healthcare responses to COVID outbreaks as they occur. And thirdly, that while we do all of this to protect our own staff and the families of our staff. So that's like the three components. We work, um, so when we work in places like the Sudan, we are the uh, sole healthcare provider for around one and a half million people. We provide healthcare in the eastern parts of Congo. We provide healthcare in Myanmar, actually, um, through our mobile health teams. We have health teams in Rwanda in the settlements. You're seeing an example of that here. So, and, and what's also, I think, um, to be positive so far, one of the dangers that refugees in particular uh, face is, um, is an outbreak of COVID within a refugee settlement. So one of the dangers you have in a settlement is that you have a lot of people living in very close proximity. You have often entire families living in just one or two rooms within houses. Uh, when they want to collect water, they have to actually go up and line up to collect water. They don't have showers inside their homes, so they have to go up and line to, um, to bathe. And so the number one thing we have to do is stop the spread of the infection. Now, there are some things working in our favor, and that is that when, when countries set up refugee settlements and refugee camps, they put them in quite distant and quite remote locations, and so it, slow, it, so it slows the spread of the virus. And thankfully, so far, we have not had a case of COVID-19 in the refugee settlements where we're working. So we have some time, um, but what we must do is stop that spread of the infection. So what you see an example here is we undertake screening. So in this example, we're taking a thermometer or temperature reading um, from people that are waiting to go inside of a clinic. But we will also do this at the entrance of refugee settlements. We'll have people screening for temperature and symptoms so that we can control who's coming in and who's going out and stopping the spread that way. We're also creating, we might slide through to the next one. We're creating hand washing stations. So you see some examples there. We're trying to put hand washing stations up throughout settlements and throughout neighborhoods and communities where we're working. As you all know, washing your hands is absolutely critical to stop the spread of the disease. So we have a lot of sort of innovative methods to do that, particularly innovative methods that rely on having a lack of water. Like in our homes, we can turn the tap on for the full 20 seconds, wash our hands under the running water, but we can't really do that in many of our locations. So the idea is to let people get their hands wet. They can then soak their hands for 20 seconds. Actually, we ask them to soak their hands for 40 seconds. That's the WHO guidelines. And then they can turn the water back on. Um, uh, the second thing that we, we also um, promote social distancing. Do you have a slide there of the social distancing coming up, Chris? Hand washing, other methods. Here's an example of social distancing occurring in places like the South, in South Sudan, in Pakistan. And we're creating some locations in, um, uh, you know, uh, allocating the six foot or two meter distance that's required. So we're also engaging in creating social distancing and education campaigns. So those are examples of some of the things we're doing to stop the spread of the infection you might click through. The second example and the second goal that we have is to maintain the existing services that we do. So Alight does uh, programs around the protection of women, children and the vulnerable in uh, the settings where we work. We do clean water and sanitation, we construct houses, we do counseling services, we provide healthcare. So we have a range of different services that we provide every day to around 3 million people every year. Uh, we need to keep those going. Uh, the second thing we need to do is um, we need to prepare ourselves, particularly in the locations where we provide health services, we need to prepare ourselves to provide um, you know, medical response when the infections actually arrive. And so we'll, we'll click through. So the kinds of things that we do there, as I mentioned, we, and every year, we treat around 1.2 million patients in our medical and health facilities. You might click through to the next one. And um, as I mentioned in Darfur, we provide, we're responsible for a population group of around one and a half million 
we also provide healthcare in many other countries, particularly in Rwanda, we provide them in um, refugee uh, settlements. So one of the things we have to do is we have to train our staff and give them refresher courses on how to look after infectious diseases. Secondly, we have to equip them in advance with the kind of treatment needs that they'll have when an outbreak occurs. And thirdly, and you see these last two slides have been examples that we have to pre-establish. You might go back to the slide before that, Chris. That we have to establish these rooms, which are quarantine facilities. You know, in the end, in most of the countries where we're working, there are very little respirators. In the entire country of Sudan, for example, I think there are four respirators, or seven respirators. So what we do in the settlements and the areas we work is we're pre-positioning and we're creating quarantine spaces like this one. So we're, we're basically commandeering youth centers, women's centers, different community gathering spaces, and preparing them in the settlements to be used as quarantine facilities. So that's part of what we're trying to do in these different countries. And then I'll go through the third slide, the next slide, is we do have to buy personal protection equipment. These are the PPEs you've been hearing about in the news. We do have to also provide this for our teams in all of those countries so that if we're asking our staff to you know, continue providing these services, that they're being looked after. So you see some examples of PPEs there. You might click through to the next slide. We're also providing training courses for all of our teams on the key ways they can protect themselves and their clients from the COVID virus. Um, so there's an example of some you know, fairly decent social distancing occurring. Now I might open it up. We have, I think we have Bernard here from our Rwanda program. Uh, they were working in a number of refugee, six refugee settlements. And so I'm gonna open it up to him. Uh, Bernard, would you like to make any comments about this? Thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks everybody for joining and uh, thanks for your support uh, that has kept us uh, going. Uh, Daniel has done a great job uh, sharing and summarizing what we do. Uh, just to share a little bit about Rwanda. So uh, we've been in Rwanda for now nearly three decades. So we are one of the longest serving humanitarian agencies in Rwanda. We are a big partner as far as uh, uh, providing different services to refugees is concerned. Uh, just to give you a sense of that, today we run health services, including running health facilities for about 60% of all refugees in Rwanda. Water, sanitation, issues of hygiene, we are covering about 50% uh, of the, for the thousands and thousands uh, of refugees who are in Rwanda. Protection services is actually exclusively done by a light in Rwanda. No other partner does uh, protection work. That includes uh, looking, ensuring there's no abuse occurring, uh, affecting or impacting on the refugees, no issues of sex or gender-based violence occurring. So uh, plus a number of other programming that we do. I mentioned those three specifically because those three pieces, health, issues of water and issues of protection become very, very critical in times of crisis or pandemic as is the case now. So what it has meant is that while the majority of agencies have had opportunity to basically stay away, it's actually been our chance to show up and actually do a lot more than we would uh, regularly be doing. Uh, we have about just a shy of 300 medical staff, including doctors, nurses, matrons, and uh, you know, persons who take care of uh, children, as well as maternity units. One of the uh, objectives, as uh, Daniel did mention, is uh, what we've worked very, very hard to ensure that the virus does not get into the camps. And this far, we are successful. Daniel did mention a number of the measures, you know, screening at various points, right from the gate, at, uh, also at the various service points, whether it's at the pharmacy or the place of collecting water or the place of, uh, you know, where you get uh, protection services, whether it's counseling. So we've ensured that we have also ensured that uh, the service points are spread so people are not crowding. Uh, we, uh, Daniel did allude to potential of the risk of crowding. One of the camps in Mahama, if I was to give you an example, uh, has about 80,000 individuals in barely, you know, a space that is bigger than maybe two football fields or less, you know, and 80,000 persons. 
in there. So social distancing, keeping crowds uh, addressed is very, very important for us. Also messaging. Uh, and I, I really want to thank uh, IDEO who worked very, very closely with the light to ensure we got very, very well done messages that were translated that we use to train communities as well as uh, our staff. Uh, the other uh, key item that uh, we did mention is, uh, or that Daniel mentioned, is around maintaining services. As I've alluded to, you, we cannot, and we did not, and we cannot stop health services, water, as well as issues of protection. So those have kept uh, going, and uh, we've ensured that stocks are uh, as close to the camps and the areas we work as possible. We've ensured that uh, protection services continue, staff are trained and ready, We've ensured that uh, additional standby staff are uh, interviewed, certified qualified ones are on standby, and this far we've been able to add to our regular teams averagely about 10 uh, additional staff across the various uh, sites. We've also partnered and worked very, very closely with the government uh, in running isolation as well as uh, full uh, quarantine uh, spaces. Uh, uh, briefly about how we are protecting our teams, uh, uh, issues of protection, masks, or the full gear, as you saw in one of the photos, for the individuals that are in very, very high risk uh, areas. We also screen and watch our staff very closely. Where we feel there might have been some contact, we quickly isolate, ensure we get them testing, and ensure they do at least a minimum of two weeks away from the rest of the team, just so we are also able to continue doing services. Right now, in partnership with the government, We've just embarked on mass testing across the various camps, just in case the virus may be hiding somewhere. And that mass testing is also covering our very own staff, just to be sure uh, it's all going okay. So thanks for the support, and uh, together we will be able to contain this. Yeah. Bernard, we've had two questions. Somebody asked us, is there oxygen available uh, in the event that we need it? And another person asked if, if there is ready availability of personal protection equipment in our countries. Would you like to speak to that in Rwanda? Yes, so, so uh, we, I would say yes, but minimal. So how this works out is that we have added, uh, enough of what may be required, including oxygen, including space, in, including nebulizer, which is an equipment that helps with breathing, which allows us to be able to keep any client or patient alive enough time for the district or the main government team to be able to come, collect them, or for us to be able to transfer them to a much higher level facility in good time. So that's what we do. We've got to balance that, yes. Good, now does anybody else, I'll open it up for now, uh, before we move into some of the special initiatives. If you have any questions, uh, would you like to put it up on the chat screen? Otherwise, we'll keep on moving through. So that's a summary of what we're trying to do in our um, in the Alight uh, programs. But we also have some special communities that we're reaching out to. So one example is that we've been working for the last number of years, increasingly with a particularly vulnerable group, which is the LGBTQ refugee community. I think many of you will have heard me say this in the past that many countries it's hard to be LGBTQ, in others it's hard to be a refugee, but in every case it's very hard to be an LGBTQ refugee. If you're a trans refugee, you're one of the very few refugees that are a threat of persecution and discrimination from other refugees in your own family. And so one of the groups we've been working with is a group of around 700 folks from that community in the city of Nairobi and we have been working with them on providing food and safe houses and looking after them. But we also have an initiative on um, Instagram called Our Kitchen Table where we're doing a special drive to provide special care for this community. When you have, um, say, uh, trans refugees and they're living in a city like Nairobi, they'll create a safe house, they'll be living behind walls. But unfortunately, you might have 30 or 40 people living together in one three bedroom house might have seven or eight people sharing rooms and bedrooms. And so the idea of social distancing is really out the window. 
They don't have soap and ways to disinfect their own houses. So many of the practices that we put in place to protect ourselves and our families, they don't have access to. Access to. Also, with our partner ORAM, we are providing um, special initiatives in the Kakuma Refugee Settlement in Kenya and on the border of Tijuana uh, for LGBTQ refugees and migrants that are vulnerable uh, to this outbreak. So what's, that's one of the communities that we're working with. I'm, if, if you see me working, here are two of our team members, and that's Manila. Uh, she's a, a trans uh, refugee based in Nairobi. Um, we're actually holding, that was when we got, first got started working there. But uh, that's one of the communities that we're close to and that we work with very closely through ORAM, uh, but also through other forms of the LIFE program. So we might click through, we may even have Jamie on the line. What you see in this example is through the Instagram post, we've got a picture there. We've been raising money and providing them with food. Uh, they're often in very difficult circumstances, meaning they can't leave their homes, not just because of social distancing, but because of uh, discrimination. And so they um, have trouble getting into grocery stores to get enough food to survive. And so we provide them assistance to create food drops to their homes uh, so that they can survive and make their way through all this. You might click through. I'm also looking into the phone as I do this so that I can see any questions that people are asking as we're sitting here. Um, we'll come back to the idea of test testing in a moment. Um, what happens if people wish to move to a safe place? It's very difficult and very hard for people to move, actually. And what about countries like the Sudan, Pakistan, Somalia, in terms of PPE? So we might come back to these questions in a moment. What I'm, I'm going to let is, I'm going to let Annie step in, who's on the line. We've also started in the last few years a program with Catholic Sisters, starting in El Salvador, and that's moved through to Mexico. And we have, we have just sort of discovered these remarkable people. Uh, I mean, all of us know about nuns, but I think we had underestimated the sheer number of nuns, the commitment they have to communities, and the closeness they have with poor people around the world. And I think we'd also underestimated the amount of people, the lack of support they get. And so we've spent the last few years trying to come up with ways that we can accelerate and work with Catholic nuns in different countries to expand and to amplify the work that they're already doing in communities. And we call this the color movement. Now, when COVID broke out, we sort of reached out to these Catholic families around the world to see if we could help them. And I might, Annie, if you're there, would you like to tell us about how many nuns you've managed to reach and how many countries and the kinds of things that you're doing? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, yes, yeah, so today we have connected with over 200 uh, Catholic nuns in um, around 28 countries. And as Daniel mentioned, um, this, the, the reach sisters have is just incredible. There's over 700,000 nuns worldwide. Um, and while Alight is a non-religious organization, we, we know humanitarians when we see them. Um, and so we, we first started working with sisters in El Salvador and the US-Mexico border. Um, the Boardwells here have just returned from uh, a trip uh, working with the sisters in El Salvador. And so as, as Daniel mentioned, when COVID um, began, we reached out to the sisters, understanding what they were doing. And we, we had a really strong concern about the sisters keeping themselves safe because while there might be lockdown and different mandates, um, the sisters will take to the streets if they know people need protected. And so we were very concerned that um, we needed to first protect the sisters so that they could protect their communities, um, because we believe that the sisters are what society needs most right now. And so we're working with them in, in three different ways. Um, most, so first, we are providing a medical training to sisters who do not come from the healthcare sector. So a lot of sisters either do um, education or social work or, or health um, care work. But for those who are in very remote places and don't have a healthcare background, we have worked with them to um, really understand their unique situations and then help create emergency plannings um, or plans for them to make sure that they are protected and can, and can protect their communities. Um, the second way we're working with them is to do um, really understand what their specific needs are 
and then provide financial assistance to them and whatever that looks like um, with the sisters always in the lead. Um, so for instance, that may be supplying the sisters in South Sudan with sewing uh, machines so that the women can stitch masks. That may mean getting sisters in Uganda uh, the protective equipment like we've been discussing, or that might mean getting uh, the sisters in on the US-Mexico border sanitizer tunnels so that everyone coming in and out of the migrant shelters are, um, are able to be sanitized. The third way we're working with sisters is to equip them with that health messaging that you heard Bernard speak of that was uh, co-designed with um, IDEO.org. The uh, messaging has been translated in over, 30, um, in over 30 languages now. And so we are supplying sisters with the messaging in their local languages so that they can continue to have a voice while they may even be in lockdown. So posting messages and um, using WhatsApp and their social media channels to make sure that they're getting the word out. So thank you all for your support uh, as we work to really accelerate this, the impact of this all female uh, sisterhood global response. Thanks, Annie. And did you say that we're, so far we've reached 200 sisters in 28 countries. So it's really remarkable. Yeah. And are really some of the most remarkable people we've ever met. And it's a great way for us to amplify um, this kind of work and to protect communities that we'd never normally have a chance to uh, work with. So thanks, Annie. So we might click through. Does anyone have, by the way, if you have a question for Annie about the sisters, you can throw it up on the screen, Annie will stay with us, as has Bernard, and we're gonna ask Bernard some more questions in a moment. Annie just alluded to a campaign that we're doing. It is still surprising, I think, for all of us that we've heard so, you know, particularly in the US, we've heard so much messaging around how you protect yourselves during this crisis, the messaging that we've got about washing our hands, about not touching our faces, about social distance, um, you know, we're getting at it sort of at every angle all the time. But in many of the places we're working, you're talking about some of the most isolated places on the planet. And, and yet, COVID can still get to all of those places. And so we have to try to stop that. And, and the sort of front line of that is health education and reaching out and being able to talk to as many people as we possibly can. And, uh, and, and doing it in a way that will make sense, doing it in a way that's using their own language, and also in a way that's fun. And we asked IDEO.org uh, to work with us on this, which is how could we come up with a health messaging campaign that could get out into sort of all of the four corners of the globe and that we could reach as many people as we could, whether you're living in a, in a, in a small village in South Sudan, whether you're living in the city of Khartoum, uh, whether you're a sister working um, in slum communities in India, uh, how, do we, how are we gonna get this out? So we created this thing called Hashtag In Our Hands, and that's a health messaging campaign. Uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the things that we've been driving the millions of people that we've been talking to all over the world. So do we have another slide here, Chris, so just click through? So here you see an example of something, um, um, some of the messaging that we use around COVID, around coughing using your elbow, about, I don't know how it is, it's all these different languages. As Annie mentioned, we've now translated this into 30 different uh, languages that, um, that we're sharing around the world. So we'll click through, and this campaign is going up as posters uh, in clinics, but also it's being driven out on social media. So this is an example of a personality from Pakistan, we have influencers from across Africa and Asia that are joining in on this, and they're posting messages. And so the idea is that we'll use social media influencers to drive out this campaign so that we can reach as many people as we possibly can. And it's been incredibly successful in Africa to drive this message out. So this is an exciting thing to be involved in globally. And I'm going to come back to you, Nicholas. It looks like they've got a nice flow of questions coming up. Um, and it is, isn't it true, one of the questions we got from Karen, isn't it true that subculture is music and lyrics to teach people? Absolutely, this is true. Actually, uh, we have songs that our teams in Congo are using. In Pakistan, actually, they're, they're, they're using radio stations. There's, there's so many different ways you can mobilize communities to be 
um, the spreaders of this message and not the spreaders of the virus. And yes, there's thousands of different ways you can do this in our communities and all of these countries are all trying in different ways. Um, but this is our uniting campaign to have the safety bill in our hands. So my quick story. So what can your hands do? We'd love you to be involved in this actually. So you can do the same thing. You can just write a message of encouragement on the, on the palm of your hand. You can write it to our teams around the world. You can write it to your friends. And you can just get on Instagram or on Twitter or on Facebook and write that up and post it. And we just ask that you do a hashtag in our hands and that way we can keep um, uh, a track of what you're doing. But we would love you to participate in this. So again, just write something on your hand and you can put it up on social media so you might click through. So that's a little bit of a summary. Now I might now go into some questions and um, try to give you some answers. So what are some other things that we've got here? How easily are tests uh, obtained? Uh, before I answer, I might open it up to you first, uh, Bernard. In Rwanda, what's happening with testing? Yes, thanks, thanks again. Th thanks, Daniel and everyone. So testing, I would say Rwanda has done a great job. There's been a lot of donations and support, including from the World Health Organization. Tests remain generally available. It's not necessarily to say it's reaching everyone, but uh, there's very, very well calculated targeting. So for example, in a refugee camp, who is most likely to come into contact, if at all, with the virus? Then that would be the traders, for example, the frontline medical teams, uh, persons who do various services, repairs of bicycles and such persons. So those are prioritized over other persons who, because of the nature of their life, daily life or daily uh, commitments may not necessarily uh, come into contact and it's free. So for those sampled because of a higher risk uh, of propensity, they do get the test uh, free of charge. In three or so days, we are able to get, uh, the tests are able to get back and uh, if uh, you are all clear and clean, you actually get a certificate issued for that, yes. Yeah, so the, uh, Rwanda is an example of a highly organized, um, you know, reasonably well-resourced country response. Testing in, in some other places is incredibly difficult. You know, testing in a place like the Sudan, very difficult. So what we, we uh, rely on there is like diagnostic testing where a person presents with the symptoms and then our doctors and nurses can diagnose them uh, with the case rather than doing the swab test out of that. So that's, um, but testing is a problem, but it's also a problem here. Um, what, um, what happens to people who wish to move to a safe place? So that all really depends on so many different things, actually. It depends on whether refugees are allowed to have free movement. It also depends on the degree to which movement is being encouraged within countries, and that's all different. So you have some places like Jordan in, um, in the Middle East that was on a complete lockdown, actually. A country like India is on a complete lockdown, meaning you can't leave your home at all. Uh, in the, the Sudan in Khartoum, there's, there's lockdown, there's curfews that are occurring. There are other countries that have much, um, their standards are much less than that. But really, for most refugees, they, they are stuck where they are. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that they can be safe in that environment. Um, let me see if anybody else has asked. Well, maybe we'll open it up now for any other questions before um, we come to our conclusion. Any other questions, thoughts? People can use the chat facility. Looks like, oh, here's some questions coming up. We have many language speakers in Minnesota too. Is it possible to share the multilingual material here? Actually, that's, that's a good question. On the line, we have Jessica, who's, who's leading this in our hands. So Jessica, would you like to speak a little bit about that, about are we using this in the US? Anything that you would like to add about the campaign? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, like Daniel and Annie have said, we've translated the messaging into 38 different languages, and we're getting more in every single day. 
and it has been made um, open source. So it's available to anybody who would like to use it. And um, we, Chris, maybe you want to throw the link up in the in the chat so everybody can see it, or we can send it out after the briefing. But you can download the social media posts. You can download posters there in a variety of different languages. So it's available for you to use as you'd like to. So we did a shout out to Nick and Sydney for helping with their translation. The donate link that you see there is live and that you can enter that in, or you can just go on to the Alight website, which is the wearealight.org website and you'll be directed somewhere. Um, what else have we got? How are you countering misinformation? Can you discern patterns of perception about COVID-19 via Kuja Kuja? That's a good question, Greg. Greg's one of the brainiacs of our wider Alight family. So it's a good one, Greg. I hope things are going well out there in Oregon. Uh, the main way that we're countering this information is by trying to drive out this campaign in a way that will reach as many people as we possibly can with strong messaging that will work in their cultural context and work with the languages that they use. And we're just trying to drive this out and get it out there and just keep repeating it. But everywhere we work, we have the same problem information as we do have um, here. Uh, we are putting up on the chat screen that our help messages are available and you can actually see them on the site and use those for yourselves. Um, to your question about Kuja Kuja, so for, for folks um, who may not have heard of that, we have a process within a light where we allow refugees to rate us when they use our services and we also ask them what ideas do they have to make us better. And it turns out Kuja Kuja has been incredibly powerful in this meaning we can now scan our data on a daily basis. We can see the rising use of the word virus or COVID. We can hear people talking about uh, the illness and we can see it rising and falling in different locations. But also, and I think critically, every single day we're getting ideas from the community on how we can provide you know, enhanced safety, particular groups that are vulnerable, and we have a sort of feedback loop that we're serving around this issue. And so we're getting literally thousands of ideas coming from the community themselves about what we can do in response to this outbreak. And our teams every day are using those ideas to improve the work that we're doing. So I'm going to look down here again. Patrick said, here in the States, there is some um, resistance to COVID restrictions. Are you finding this in the camps um, or are most um, supportive of the health measures? So would you like to add anything there, Bernard? It's like here you're seeing a pushback in the US about being people being restricted to their homes and people are going out now into parks and beaches and different places. How are you finding the response in the refugee settlements in Rwanda to this restriction? Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. So uh, again, as uh, Daniel alluded to, Rwanda has done a very good job in terms of getting these organized and uh, rolled out. Uh, just for your information, Rwanda has been on a 100% lockdown since around the mid of the month of March. So two full months of not much economic activities except essential services. And uh, the initial and continuing messaging has basically ensured, and because of trust on the governance and uh, various leadership structures, it's worked well so far. We. The occasions when there's been a bit of uh, tension, but it's only taken a meeting or two to clarify why it's important for us to keep low for the moment uh, for a better, bigger, perhaps healthier future. So, so far, so good. It's, it's, it's working well. Yeah. Good. Does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, so I'll say this, it's responding to the coronavirus and COVID-19, uh, we've got one here from Ted, what things are open on Rwanda? Bernard, would you like to step in before I do my concluding remarks? So, so thanks again. Uh, Rwanda just uh, did a partial uh, lifting of the lockdown, but as we speak, you're only allowed any business, any organization, any agency is allowed a maximum of 50% of its operations, as well as staff. Social distancing must be maintained. Uh, masks must be worn by everyone. 
uh, not limited to medical persons. But on average, any business is open as long as those basic rules are being followed for the next two weeks. That is subject to be reviewed around uh, 15th of uh, this month of May. And then if it's all going well, perhaps slightly larger or much bigger than 50%. Are there any, so Bernard, we've got a question from Katie about any special measures being taken for the elderly. Would you like to give an answer to that? And also Martha asked about the role of UNHCR. Would you like to speak to both of those? How are we helping particularly vulnerable groups like the elderly, um, uh, the disabled, and uh, what's the role of UNHCR in all of this? Good. So if I start off with the UNHCR basically plays a coordination role. Uh, any given time. UNHCR does not on any given day deliver programming, not only this time. So any given day, they're basically coordinators. They allow, they also allow, uh, facilitate access to resources, whether in kind or in terms of money or, uh, or grants or projects. So, and uh, then they also uh, staff with particular technical persons who we can consult and work with uh, to better inform the work that we are doing. So those are the key roles that UNHCR does. Also, of course, on again, on a good day, they would also be handling, directly handling issues of resettlement to a different country. That's a big piece of what it does, not the daily services that uh, uh, refugees or displaced persons uh, need. Uh, in terms of uh, groups that may be at higher risk of exposure, part of what the program, our health program is doing now and all of the services that we're providing is prioritize such persons. So closer monitoring, uh, 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 positive discrimination so that they're able to access services a lot better. If I give a practical example around nutrition, there are specific numbers we typically look at before, say, a child who is under five is administered or admitted to receive extra special food. We've lowered that mark so that more children, given the risk of a pandemic in general, are able now to access the extra and special food. So such dis uh, positive discrimination is happening so that persons who would generally be at a higher risk, we have persons who live with HIV as part of our program. We have those records kept safely as, as is required. We are ensuring that they are not being forgotten and they are accessing whatever medications and support they need, uh, even as we deal with this larger pandemic issue. Good, thanks, Bernard. Um, so I, I would just say in, in summary, where are we at with all of this? I think we've seen that around the world, the spread of the pandemic occurs like waves. And right now, and you've noticed this within the US, it's, it, you know, there's like low rates and then suddenly there's the others to take off. This is in Italy and many other countries. Thankfully, we have not seen that yet occurring in the countries that we're working Many of those countries actually responded very quickly, locked their countries down very quickly. Uh, there's also much less movement typically uh, in, in countries. And as I mentioned earlier, our refugees and the people that we work with are often living in very isolated locations. The good news with all of this is that it's taken time uh, for the infection to spread, it's taken time for the virus to arrive. But now in every country where we work, COVID-19 exists, even in a place like South Sudan now, there are cases of COVID-19. So the question that we're really all asking ourselves is how long do we have before there is a takeoff of infection? Um, on the plus side, it has allowed organizations like ours and UNHCR to prepare ourselves for such an outbreak. So our teams, like Bernard's team, have done really a remarkable job getting ready to both uh, undertaking the mitigating work that's required to stop the spread, but also to prepare for the day when it finally arrives in the camp. Because it takes time to get to these settlements, but when it gets there, we're very concerned that it will take off like wildfire. And we have, so we have to prepare and get ourselves in place and we've spent the last more than a month preparing and getting ready for that. So right now we're in that lull period where our teams are prepared, uh, we have the equipment, we're ready um, to work on this, but it hasn't broken out. But that could literally be changing over the next few weeks. I really appreciate the fact that you're sticking with us um, and participating in this. 
And that's what we're trying to do right now is we have a match campaign going on around this, uh, on this Tuesday. Uh, anything that you donate will be matched by our board of directors up to $100,000. And actually one of our big focuses is on providing the personal protection equipment that our teams need because when this takes off, they're being brave, incredibly brave, at staying in their workplace and providing their services. But we need to make sure that we can protect them as they do that. And so it's a big part of our fundraising today is about ensuring that our service teams who are staying in these locations can be looked at throughout this whole process. I would just say in closing that um, it's we're all involved in, in and I, I know we all, I suppose I would say this, that this is an interesting moment for us in, in a place like the United States to deepen the empathy that we have for the communities that we work with. There was an interesting exchange that happened with some, some of the mothers in our Congolese program where they told us that they are praying for us in the US. And when we asked them why, they said, well, we are used to living in environments like this, where we have the threat of Ebola. We're used to living in environments where we have, uh, you know, health systems that can't always meet our expectations. We're used to not having enough food. We're used to being concerned about whether we'll be able to get medication. We're used to feeling sort of chronic vulnerability that we can't protect our families. And so we have built the community support mechanisms. We've built the internal coping mechanisms so that we can look after ourselves when these kinds of things happen. But the trouble is for you folks in the West, you've been able to rely on so many of these external things that you may not have built up the internal coping mechanisms that you need to get through this. And that's why they're praying for us. And so we do have a moment here where we can experience a little bit about what life is like for a refugee. We're stuck in our homes, our movement is limited. The concern that we may catch some kind of um, um, you know, dreadful disease, we're worried that the institution and system that surrounds us will be able to look after us. We're very frightened for our own families that they'll survive all this. And the truth is that for almost all of us, we will survive this, we will get through this. But it does give us an opportunity to have empathy and to understand a little bit about what it's like to be a refugee. And so we are trying to embrace that as an organization to deepen our commitment and deepen our understanding. Um, I can promise you that we're gonna keep working and that our teams will stay in place and that we will be ready for when the outbreak uh, occurs, and it could, as I said, happen any time. I want to say thank you all for joining the call and being interested. Um, you know, right now, for all of us, we would like the world to be different. We would like the world to be more quote-unquote normal. And as I alluded to earlier, actually, this is normal life. It's just that we experience a very special version of life. But now we're seeing what it's like for many people that live around the world, actually, what is normal. But we want it to be more stable. We want to understand what's going to happen. But the truth is we can't control that. But what we can control as people is how we respond in this moment. We can respond and we can decide how we're going to show up every day. And we can make the choice. Are we going to hoard the resources we have and isolate ourselves? Or are we going to choose as a, to come together with a community of people that care. And even if we can't have physical proximity, uh, we can actually have social proximity and that's what we're doing now. So can we come together as a community and act as givers and change agents? And so within a light, that's the choice that we are making. We can't change the world, way the world is. We can change the way we respond to the world and we can step up not isolate and not hoard, but instead to join a community of people that care and to give into that space. We, you are invited to join with us. We're invited to donate today, but there are many other ways. We heard from, uh, from Nicholas that's helping us with our translations. There are many other ways that you can join in with us and be part of our community as we help. I think it's key that at the end of all of this, 
that we just became better versions of ourselves. And the gift that this COVID pandemic is giving us is the chance in an environment that feels scarce and feels frightening that we can be brave and show up as the kind of person we want to be. So thank you all for joining. We're coming to the conclusion. A few of us will stay on and we'll answer any other questions that you may have. But otherwise, thank you to all of you. We can't do what we do without you. Thanks Bernard for joining us, Annie and Jessica for chiming in. But to all of you and those that ask questions, thank you. And a few of us will stay on again, but otherwise we appreciate you all.